Good evening again. We are, this is our third session in the Doctrine of the Holy Spirit. This is, uh, of course, TH 464A, and we're looking at some of the practical minister, ministries of the Holy Spirit. I want to pick up where we left off in our last class. We were looking at two of the particular uses of the word convict, and in the first meaning of it, we saw that it means to amass enough verifiable evidence against someone to produce a guilty verdict. And in the second use of the word in the New Testament, it actually meant to convince. It was when the Holy Spirit would reach down into a man or a woman's heart and work in their life in such a way to convince them of their need for the Lord Jesus Christ. It means to persuade people of those things that are eternally wrong before God and of their need for salvation. And we ended by asking the question, why, why does he want to convince men? And the reason for that was so that he would not judicially have to convict them as we saw in the meaning of the first word. If a man rejects the convincing ministry of the Holy Spirit, then he will face the convicting ministry, the judicially convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit uh, at a later time. Now, I want you to look here in John chapter 16 and verse 8 specifically, because at this point in what Jesus is communicating, he amplifies what he said the conviction of the Holy Spirit would be and the amplification is really very, very interesting because it is not at all what we might think that it would be. When the Holy Spirit convicts the world of sin, obviously we would think of all the horrible sins that men commit. That men commit. There's murder and there's those men that are thieves or, or liars and uh, people that cheat. There is adultery and fornication, there's pornography, uh, unfaithfulness, sensuality. Uh, they're just incredibly barbaric acts of war and all of those kind of things. There are listings throughout the scriptures. There's one in Galatians, there's one in Revelation chapter 20 or 21 of the, the terrible sins that men commit. But I want you to notice what Jesus said here in verse 9 of uh, John chapter 16 when he says that he will convict the world of sin because they do not believe in me. In reality, there is only one, what we might consider it to be one eternally deadly sin that men can commit, and that is the sin of unbelief. It is the sin of not believing in the Lord Jesus Christ for salvation. I do not care what someone has done or what their past may be hiding. I think all of us, myself included, any one of us, have things in our past that we are not proud of, things that we wish that we had not done, but unfortunately we did things that we would change if we could, but we can't. Everyone has those kind of things. Some are worse, some are more uh, profound than somebody else's may be, but as far as God is concerned, sin is sin. And so, even though someone may be hiding things from their past, what we know is that the blood of Jesus Christ cleanses a man from all sin. No matter what that sin may have been. You could take the person that you considered to be the worst sinner in the world, the worst person that had ever lived, the one person that had committed more horrific crimes against humanity, against people. Uh, I remember uh, about what has happened in Zimbabwe and how in the villages that we were in just this past month, how that a number of years ago, before, uh, right after the current leader in that country 
took over probably 40 or 50 years ago, he went into those village areas and he literally killed every male that lived in those villages. He killed the young boys. He killed all the pastors. He killed anyone that was a Christian. Uh, man, woman, child, didn't really matter. And the whole, that whole region was devastated. They, they have existed literally for almost two generations without, without any Christian influence. And that, that kind of sin is so horrific that it just is mind-boggling. But we know from Scripture that if that individual would ever come to Christ, that those sins would be placed under the blood of Jesus Christ. Obviously, he has a lot to lose in terms of rewards, but still as ter in, in, in terms of the salvific work of Christ, those sins would be forgiven. There's only one sin that really condemns a man when they stand before God, and that is the sin of of unbelief, of not believing in Jesus Christ and His saving work. So when the Holy Spirit is convicting someone of the sin of unbelief, there is something inside of them that is working on them. There is this work, this ministry, this moving, this... Uh, uh, work within the individual being produced in them by the Holy Spirit where they know because of his ministry and because of his convicting work in them it keeps saying to them uh, convincing them persuading them that in reality they are guilty it's like he convicts and deep inside they say I'm guilty I know that and they may fight it they may resist it they may do everything they can to weasel out of that conviction, but deep down, they know and they understand that they are guilty before God. And so the Holy Spirit's conviction, I think, has the ability to almost crush an individual to the ground, and, and very often he does. So why does the Holy Spirit want to bring all of this up? It's just simply so that a man will see their need for Christ. If there was no conviction of the Holy Spirit, if the Holy Spirit did not work in this particular way, if we never preached the gospel, if, if the message of salvation was never communicated, men would never come to Christ. Men would never, never accept Christ and believe in Christ and believe in his work. There must be, there has to be, it is an absolute necessity that there has to be the conviction of the Holy Spirit in the life of an unbeliever so that they can see and understand and appreciate their particular need for Christ. You know, in a real sense, even though we may not enjoy it when it occurs, pain is really a very good thing because it lets the person who is hurting know that something is wrong somewhere. So from that perspective, pain can be a very good thing. If, if you never felt any pain, then the slightest thing could actually kill you. Uh, people that have internal injuries, they, they, they feel a discomfort. They, they feel a pain. I, I have uh, personally battled through cancer on two different occasions. And the unfortunate part about cancer, especially in the stages in which I had it, there was no pain. There was no way of me knowing that I had something growing inside of me that could actually kill me. So from, from a physical perspective, from a, a health perspective, Having some level of pain is, is like a, a light bulb that goes off to let us know that something is not right. And so, in the same way, the Holy Spirit works to lay open the heart of an individual to his deep conviction of sin and unbelief so that they may recognize that there's something wrong and actually come to Christ. 
Now, it is important to notice in verse 9 how Jesus specifically identifies this. He says of sin, because they do not believe in me. It is the specific sin of unbelief in Jesus Christ. That's why he uses the term, they do not believe in me, speaking of himself. It's not the sin of stealing. It's not the sin of drunkenness. It's not the sin of idolatry or adultery or fornication or whatever it may be. It's not the sin of, of cheating. It is the sin of not believing specifically in the person of Jesus Christ and then not yielding our life to Him in a childlike, childlike acceptance and faith and obedience. In the final judgment, when it is determined whether an individual goes to heaven or hell, it will be determined solely, solely on whether or not they believed in Jesus Christ. There will be no other parameter. There will be nothing else by which the individual is judged relative to their final destination, whether it's in the kingdom of God or separated from God in a place of eternal torment. It is an eternally fatal issue to reject Jesus Christ, to be casually indifferent to His demands on our life. All along the way, all along the way, the Holy Spirit was constantly saying to that individual, do not reject Christ. Do not ignore Christ. Do not deny Christ. Do not refuse Christ. Place your faith in Christ because you need a Savior. And then ultimately he will say that because they did reject Him, He will exercise His judicial conviction and condemn them into eternal judgment. The great damning sin is failure to come to Christ in sincere faith and repentance. I want you to remember to look at what Jesus said to Nicodemus in John chapter 3 in verse 17 and 18. He said, For God did not send His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. He who believes in him is not condemned, but he who does not believe is condemned already because he has not believed in the name of the only begotten Son of God. It's not because a man is a cheater. It's not because a man is a thief. It's not because a man is an adulterer or a murderer. He is condemned because he simply did not believe in the only begotten Son of God and in His work. This is the condemnation, that light has come into the world and men love darkness rather than the light. So that thing for which God will bring somebody into judgment is their not believing in His provision through Jesus Christ for their salvation. Christ is always the defining issue. Always. In every case. Christ is the defining issue. It does not matter how good someone is. It does not matter how bad someone is. It does not matter. The only thing that matters is what have they done with Jesus Christ. In John chapter 5, and verse 40, Jesus stated it this way. He says, But you are not willing to come to me that you may have life. He does not say that the problem is all of these little sins in someone's life. Well, you haven't been living properly. You haven't been doing what I want you to do. You've been doing things that are outside the boundaries of my word and outside of the boundaries of Scripture. And so for that reason, we're, you're going to be condemned. He says the reason that a man will be condemned is simply because he's not willing to come to Christ. 
So that is the ministry. That is the work. That is the convincing, the reproving, the rebuking part of the conviction of the Holy Spirit in a person's life. Convicting them of their incredible need for Jesus Christ. He simply says, you are not willing to come to me. In John chapter 5, verse 43, he says, again, he says, I've come in my Father's name, and you did not receive me. I wasn't worth it to you. You didn't think that what I said had any value. You simply would not receive my word. Another comes in his own name, him you will receive. The great issue between God and man is not really the sin question. It's the son question. It's not the number of sins or how bad the sins are. It's simply what did someone do with Jesus Christ? We need to appreciate the simplicity of this. I know that for many of you, you certainly are probably mature in the faith, not necessarily a, a new believer. You maybe have been studying, and all of this is what you might consider to be Christianity 101. It might be elementary, ABC-type doctrinal issues to you. But in some way, I think that it's important for us to be reminded and to reiterate the simple truths of the scripture. Whenever you talk to somebody about Christ, it's easy to be distracted. It's easy to be sidetracked. It's easy to get off of what the real issues are. I was talking to someone recently who has been living in sin for a long time. He is an unbeliever, has never come to Christ. I, I've talked with him often. I've talked with him on many different occasions about his salvation. I've never sort of let him off the hook. I've never tried to appease his indifference and his rebellion against God in any way. At every opportunity, I talked to him about his salvation. Some very negative things began to happen in his life. He lost his family. He lost his wife. Uh, not physically, but emotionally. And then there was a divorce. And he contacted me one day and he wanted to know, he says, why does God allow all of these things to happen in my life? And I asked him, I said, uh, I said, why does God get blamed for everything? Why do you feel like you can just blame God for all of your bad decisions and for your lifestyle? You think that God is sort of a uh, can just wave a magic wand out there and just clean up all of your mistakes. And a little bit later on, he, he sort of tried to refute that. And I told him in no uncertain terms, I said, you're a mocker of God. You mock God. You mock Christ. You mock what Jesus Christ has done for you. The only hope that you have is not that you clean up your life. It's not that you turn over a new leaf. It's not that you make some new decisions. The only hope that you have is that the Holy Spirit will work in your life in such a way that He draws you to Christ and you come and you receive that incredible work of Christ on your behalf. Apart from that, you have no hope whatsoever. You see, we have to keep the message 
the same as it is in the Scriptures. When the Holy Spirit comes, He will convict the world of sin, it says, because they do not believe in Me. We have to keep the message the same as the Scripture keeps it. The closer that we are aligned to Scripture, the more blessing, the more anointing, the more the Holy Spirit will be able to work in us and to work through us to bring people to Christ. The issue is not the sin question. It's what have you done with Jesus Christ? That is the issue. I wonder what it is about a man that died on a cross, hung on a cross, stripped naked, bleeding, dying. I wonder what it is about that man, the God-man, on the cross, dying, that can so tear open a person's heart. Someone may hear this kind of teaching somewhere, and there is this turmoil on the inside, a, what we might call a, a kind of holy discomfort that's being created within them, this sort of spiritual restlessness that is taking place in their life. I know what it is. You know what it is. It is the convicting of the Holy Spirit and the sin of rejecting Christ and choosing to live the way that someone wants to live as opposed to placing their faith in the work of Jesus Christ on their behalf. The one thing that God demands of all men is that they place their faith in Christ for salvation. There are no other options. It's A or nothing. It's one or nothing. It's not A, B, C. Make a choice as to which one you like the best, which one suits you the best. There's only one option. And the Holy Spirit, when He is dealing in the area of salvation, is going to exercise the ministry of conviction, and He's going to say, you do not believe in Christ. You must be born again. You must be born of the Spirit. You must come to Christ on His terms or you will die in your sins. The one thing, the one single thing that God demands of all men, and He has to give them the grace to believe. He has to give them the faith to believe. He has to give to them the gift of repentance or they will not come. One thing that he demands is that they put their faith, their God-given faith, in the person and work of Jesus Christ. And that they are willing to entrust their life to him without reservation. So the one sin that will define eternity for every single individual is that of believing or not believing in Jesus Christ. That's important to understand in John chapter 16 verses 8 through 11 that it's dealing specifically with the Holy Spirit's ministry to the lost, to the unsaved, to the unregenerate, to those individuals that do not know Christ. These are not verses that apply directly to the believer. Even though we know, we know specifically, there are plenty of other places in the scriptures that would identify this for us, that the Holy Spirit will convict a believer of sin in their life. He will convict them of uh, that which is right of that which God desires for their life. He will convict them of the consequences of not following Christ, of, of the judgment to come. Every believer will be judged, not for salvation, 
but for rewards. That's what happens at the judgment seat of Christ. You and I will be judged. Our works will, will be brought before God. It will be like they will be placed in, in, in fire and the wood, hay, and stubble will simply burn and that which we have done that has counted for Christ, that which has been worthy of His name, that which has honored Him, it will not burn. It will be like precious stones and gold and silver. But we will be rewarded according to to how we have lived for Christ. And so we know that the Holy Spirit will convict us of these three specific things. But verse 8 is very clear that the conviction that's spoken of here is a conviction that is directed, that is aimed, that is targeted at the unsaved. Jesus put it this way when he said, He will convict the world of these things. We know from John chapter 3, verse 19 through 20, that the world, that the lost, that the unsaved actually hate the light. They hate being told the truth because what happens when they understand the truth is that it exposes them. It exposes their sin. It exposes their unbelief. And they do not like that exposure. It says in verse 19 and 20, And this is the condemnation that light has come into the world, and men love darkness rather than light, because their deeds were evil. For everyone practicing evil hates the light. They hate the truth. They hate the truth of God's word. Everyone practicing evil hates the light and does not come to the light, lest his deeds should be exposed. It should be evident. It should be clear to all of us that God is long-suffering, God is merciful, He's patient, He's kind, he, the sun rises on, on the just and the unjust alike, He sends the rain on the just and the unjust alike. But it ought to be evident that unbelievers will simply not have an endless number of chances to respond to Christ. They will only have a certain number of opportunities to respond to the convicting work of the Holy Spirit. And no one, absolutely no one, has any knowledge whatsoever as to how many opportunities that may be. Some people today will hear the gospel for the last time. They may hear it on their deathbed. They may hear it from a friend. They may hear it on the radio. Some pastor may go and talk to them. But it may be the last time that they will ever hear the gospel message. They may die. They may be involved in an automobile wreck. They may be in some kind of accident. They may have a heart attack. They do not know how many more opportunities that they have. Neither do I. We don't know that. It could be ten. It could be a thousand. It could be one. It could be none. There's not a great deal of teaching in, in, the, in the scriptures relative to this issue, but it is still clear that the opportunities that God provides for individuals is not unlimited. It's not unlimited. Sometimes I think we believe that it is, but it's not. We don't know what the limit is. We don't know how often or when God may work in a person's life. You went to John chapter 6. I, I know that you probably have had this happen to you very often. You probably have had people come to you and they have 
and you have communicated the gospel and you have done it clearly and succinctly. You have been articulate in what you said and communicated to them. You understood the gospel. You knew how to appropriate the gospel to someone, how to communicate it to them, and you did an excellent job, and they, and they refused to come to Christ. Over the years of the Christian, I've shared the gospel with many, many people. And I would say that the majority of people have not accepted the gospel. And to this day, many of them are still indifferent. Some of them have died. Uh, some of them have uh, ignored uh, God's call on their life to, to salvation. But many times in sharing the gospel, someone may say something like this. I'm sure that this has happened to you at some time. You shared the gospel. You opened your heart. You did as good a job as you possibly knew how. And somebody said to you these these often repeated words, I'm not ready. I will come to God when I get ready. And my response is always the same. No, you won't. No, that's not the case at all. In John chapter 6, verse 44, I know I've mentioned this verse a couple of times. It says, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. You can't just come at any time. There has to be this work, this wooing, if you want to call it that. This compelling by the Spirit of God for someone to actually come. It says in John chapter 6, verse 65, Therefore I have said to you that no one can come to me unless it's been granted to him by my Father. A person cannot just say, well, I'll come to Christ whenever I get good and ready. No, you won't. It doesn't work that way, and you need to recognize that and to realize that. So there's not a great deal of teaching in this area, but I still think that it's clear that the opportunities are not unlimited for people to come to Christ. Thank God for His long-suffering. Thank God for His patience. Thank God for His love. Thank God for all of those qualities and attributes that make Him God. I praise God that He's patient. I praise God that He was patient with me. You should praise God that He was long-suffering with you as well. We don't know. We just do not know when that work of the Holy Spirit may be removed from a person's life. I believe there are people that have been sitting in churches for years and years and years and years. They've heard the gospel. They've heard the gospel preached. They've heard it taught. They've, they've actually understood the message. But they've never come to Christ. They are living under the illusion that they are saved. When in reality, they are not. That is the greatest of all illusions. For someone to think that they're saved, when in reality, there's nothing in their life to reflect it. Now the problem that man has, is that prior to salvation, that no one sees themselves the way that God sees them. Absolutely no one. There's no lost man, lost woman, unregenerate young person out there, that sees themselves in the same way that God sees them. Everybody has a much, much higher opinion of themselves than God has of them. And so the Holy Spirit has to convince and persuade them, persuade us of our sinfulness and of our unrighteousness and of our spiritual wickedness before God. Just words like that, terms like that, just that kind of articulation of what is in the scriptures are an affront to the lost man. Everybody thinks that they are better than someone else. And in most 
every case, that is probably true. But the problem is, is that they have the wrong standard. The standard of righteousness is not somebody else. It's not your neighbor. It's not somebody that you work with in the workplace. It's not somebody down at the local church. It's not your pastor. The standard is not someone else. The standard is Christ. The issue is always the Son. And so, just those kind of words are an affront to the lost man, for he never sees himself in the same light that God does. It's, listen, it's a tremendous effort there is a, an overwhelming obstacle that the Holy Spirit has to overcome in someone's life to convince them that they are wicked, that they are sinful, that they are unrighteous, that they are not deserving of God's mercy and long-suffering and especially of God's salvation. Jeremiah chapter 17 and verse 9 says, the heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? It's not that the heart is, every once in a while, is deceived. It says the heart is deceitful above all things, above everything. The heart, the very thing that we hold the dearest, the very thing that we think is the most precious that we understand ourselves and we understand what we're like and we understand the truth. The heart is deceitful. It's deceiving. And it's deceitful above all things. And it is desperately wicked. Just go tell that to the lost man who believes that he is good. That he's a good father, a good worker. And by every standard that we have, he may be. He may be a good provider. He may work very hard and diligently. He may be faithful to his wife. He may be a good model for his children in certain areas. But as far as God is concerned, all of his righteousness is worthless. And he simply cannot appreciate that. He cannot understand that. We all have an estimation of ourselves that is wrong simply because our hearts are so deceitful. Hey, even as a Christian, even as a believer, even as someone who's been a believer for a long time, I'm sure that I have a, an opinion about myself that's overinflated. Hopefully the older that we become as Christians and the more mature that we are in Christ, the more that we see ourselves the way that God sees us. I'm glad that when God sees me that he first sees his son. If I was the only thing that God had to look through or to look to, I would be in desperate trouble. But he sees me not as I am, he sees me, he sees you in Christ. Even in the last days church of Laodicea, the church itself has no idea as to how to examine itself, to come up with a proper estimation of what it is like. If the church, if the church is inaccurate in its assessment of itself, what should we expect from the lost? We have this uncanny ability to exaggerate our personal virtues and merits while at the same time losing all perspective on our actual sinfulness before God. I praise God for His forgiveness. I praise God for the blood of Jesus Christ. I, I praise God that the Holy Spirit has revealed that it's not my righteousness. It's not my goodness. 
But it's the work of Christ. It's the righteousness of Christ that's been applied to me. That's been placed on my account and on your account. I am utterly convinced that all I can do is to preach and to pray that the Holy Spirit convicts men of their sin. When we go out into the villages and into the bush to evangelize, the message is simple. We don't talk about the church. We don't talk about denominations. We don't talk about anything other than the gospel. Because we believe in the power of the gospel from Romans chapter 1 to bring men into salvation. And that's what it does. Last October, almost a year ago, we had over 1,300 people come to Christ in a week. This past week, or past month, when we were back, we had many, many people come to Christ. Just several hundred numbers of churches started in the village that I primarily worked in, a very, very large village, probably five or six miles long, a mile and a half, two miles wide. That's a lot of territory to cover. People living everywhere. On the first Sunday after we left, we had 219 people, new believers, to come for their first service. And they came the next week and the week after. Was it something that I did? No, it wasn't. It was something the gospel did. It was something the Holy Spirit did. It was a work of God in their life. And we have to rest in the power of the gospel because the Holy Spirit has already communicated to us that that is what he uses to bring men to Christ. It's not our cleverness. It's not all of our programs and our ingenuity. It is the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit to convict men of sin and of righteousness and of judgment. And we ought to let him do that. The worst thing that I can do, the absolute worst thing that you can do is to try and embellish the gospel to make it pleasing to make it acceptable to people it's probably the most hated message in all the world but it's the most powerful and that simple message can change a man's heart and his life forever if we will just let it do what it is supposed to do all I can do is preach and pray, share the gospel just in a short presentation, 15, 20 minutes of communicating the gospel in a clear and succinct way. And God uses his word and God uses you. He uses his instruments to communicate that word. But what happens between a man's head and what he hears and his heart, only the Holy Spirit can do that work. Someone's going to say, well, Pastor, we, we already know these things. These are simple, basic, fundamental, elementary truths that we understand. Would you please tell us something that's much, much deeper. Would you not just take us to another place here in the teaching? We understand that it's the work of the Holy Spirit. Listen. Listen to me very, very carefully. It ought to be evident that the church, those who lead in the church, not every church, not everyone, not every pastor, but in an overriding overview of what's taking place 
in the church and in Christianity, in the culture in which we live, the gospel has been minimized. And because it's been minimized, because it's been tampered with, because it's been embellished, because we've added to it, we've taken away, we've removed, we've quenched, we've grieved the work of the Holy Spirit. And it's a very, very sad thing. There are just times when we, all of us, Every single one of us, we need to be reminded of those things that are basic and those things that are simple. We need to be reminded of those things that God uses and those things that God doesn't use. God doesn't use my creativity. He doesn't use my ingenuity. He doesn't use my cleverness. He uses His Word. He uses His Gospel. The Holy Spirit is the one who convicts a man of sin and of righteousness and judgment. All I can do is get the words of God and the truth of God into a man's ears. And what happens from that point to this place in their heart is something that the Holy Spirit has to do. My, my part of the task is really very simple. It's not a complicated thing. It's, it's amazing. I, I Just this last month, I, I would go from homestead to homestead, and the message would be exactly the same. It would be exactly the same. And just every homestead we went into, with the exception of two or three, over the entire six or seven days, people came to Christ. There was no cleverness. There was no creativity in how this was presented. There was no PowerPoint presentation. There was no music. There was no praise band. It was just the gospel. And that's what the Holy Spirit uses. That is His work. And we cannot in any way Try to embellish that. If we do, all we do is diminish the effectiveness of both the gospel and the work and ministry of the Holy Spirit. I think that at times we can argue and reason with people and argue the scriptures to try and make men see the utter depravity of their lost condition but unless the Holy Spirit intervenes, unless the Holy Spirit is convicting, all of our efforts will be utterly ineffective. I want you to be able to appreciate one of the reasons why we even go to church. It is because preaching is the primary means by which God has chosen to save those who believe. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 21 says this. It says, For since in the wisdom of God, the world through wisdom did not know God, it, ple it pleased God through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. It's just through the foolishness of the message that man is a sinner, that Christ is a Savior to save those who believe. Listen to me very carefully. Listen to my heart. Listen to what I really want to say and communicate to you as we go through this work of the Holy Spirit. I want you to hear what I'm going to say. Preaching is always a matter of life and death. The issue is not whether we're going to grow or whether or not we're going to be faithful in our Christian life. Those are good things. Those are very, very good things. But they are not the issue. 
They are good issues. They are important issues. They are things that we as Christians must address in our own personal lives. But the real issue is whether or not people are going to live or die. Not whether they're going to be good or better. The issue is a matter of life and death. Whether someone's going to live or whether someone is going to die. That is what is at stake. And somehow I have to bring my life into alignment with that. I have to be willing to align behind that in the communication of the message relative to the work of the Holy Spirit. We live in the Laodicean church age. It's an age of just drifting. It's an age of having an overall attitude of spiritual indifference. I remember back in October of last year, the teams would go out into the village areas and they would communicate the gospel and then at night they would congregate in a central location because there were many that they had not necessarily reached. Their, their places that we didn't know actually existed, that someone was there, but somehow within the villages they had this ability to communicate. And word would get out that at night somebody was going to show a film. On one night, there was an individual that had walked 50 miles. Let me say that again. He had walked 50 miles. He had heard somehow, some way, 50 miles away that they were going to be showing the Jesus film. And he came that far. I don't know about you. I don't know what it's like in your church. I have people that live just down the road, just up the road, just over there, just back here, who can find all kinds of excuses for not being a part of God's church. You know what I think about people like that? I know this is arrogant on my part. You'll just have to adjust it a little bit. I think they're living under an illusion. I think many of them, because they're not willing to take the things of God seriously or the church seriously, they are living under the illusion that they are saved when in reality they may not be saved. And if they are saved, they are losing a great deal eternally. In many churches, there is a relatively small number of faithful, committed believers. To be quite honest, it appears that many Christians, unfortunately, seem to just simply be bored with Christ and bored with His Word, bored with the Christian life, bored with the church. We have people that football practice or soccer, soccer practice or softball practice or game on Wednesday night is much more important than meeting together to study the Word of God and to pray. I'm sure that happens at your church. I think it happens at almost every church. We have many churches that don't even any longer have a midweek service because nobody attends. It's an age of spiritual Indifference. Listen to how Hebrews chapter 2, verse 1 through 3, the first part of verse 3, addresses this attitude when it says, Therefore we must give the more earnest heed to the things we have heard as we drift away. For if the word spoken through angels prove steadfast, and every transgression and disobedience received a just reward, how shall we escape if we neglect so great a salvation? He's not talking to lost people there. Lost people cannot neglect salvation because they don't have it. You can't neglect something that you don't have. How can we escape? 
if we neglect such a great salvation. What characterizes this church age is this spiritual drifting and a spiritual indifference to the things that are sacred, what the author calls a neglecting of so great of salvation. Probably the strongest warning that's given in Hebrews comes in Hebrews chapter 10. And this is such a strong warning, it's hard to even read. It says in verse 29, of how much worse punishment do you suppose he will be thought worthy who has trampled the Son of God underfoot? Listen to this. And counted the blood of the covenant by which he was sanctified a common thing. In other words, we've taken the things that are holy, we've taken the things that are sacred, and we have treated them as if they are unholy, as if they are not sacred. I, I believe that the Word of God, that the Church of God, that these are holy things that God has placed in to every believer's life, and I cannot just take them lightly. I cannot just ignore them. I can't just take these godly things and trample them underfoot, treat them as if they are a common thing. And yet, unfortunately, I believe that's exactly what happens in a lot of people's lives. You know what frightens me for people probably the most people that are in churches is their lack of biblical commitment to both Christ and His church. No wonder there's a great need for the conviction of the Holy Spirit in the world. You know, one of the things that the author says here in Hebrews chapter 10 after he goes through this amazing passage there, this, this incredible warning. He talks about insulting the spirit of grace. He says, the Lord will judge his people. And they say, well, the Lord's going to judge all the lost because they're indifferent and spiritually lethargic and have no real interest in the things of God. God says that he will judge his own people. He will discipline his people. We get to Hebrews chapter 12 and we have this Tremendous exhortation about his discipline. The one sin above all others that utterly reveals and exposes a man's great sinfulness before God is his defiance and not being willing to submit his life to Jesus Christ. Even after repeated appeals by the Holy Spirit. It's mentioned earlier. An individual has absolutely no way of knowing when the God-ordained, the God-given opportunities may cease and when the Holy Spirit with, will withdraw himself from ever speaking to them again. And listen to me. Unless the Holy Spirit is involved in this drawing work, that individual cannot come. They will never come apart from this convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit. Next, John chapter 16, verse 10 through 11 states that the Holy Spirit will convict the world of righteousness and of judgment. The Holy Spirit wants us to fully understand that we are dealing with a righteous God, a holy God, a sinless God. It never has been or ever will be a conformity to some earthly standard. Christ is our standard. God the Father is our standard. And our life will ultimately and eventually be measured against the righteousness and the holiness of God Himself. So in order to have an accurate gauge of where we are spiritually, we must have the right standard by which to measure ourselves. And that is, there's only one that exists. It is the person of Jesus Christ. 
So if an individual wants to know where they are spiritually, then they must measure themselves against God's standard. Verse 10 says, <clears throat> Of righteousness, because I go to my Father and you see me no more. When Jesus Christ was placed on the cross, what happened was that God made him to be sin for us. He actually became sin. 2 Corinthians chapter 5, verse 21 says, For he made him who knew no sin to be sin for us, that we might become the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. And then after having been made sin and paying the penalty for that sin, God raised him from the dead and brought him into his presence. Now what we learn from John chapter 16 and verse 10 is that God accepted Christ into his presence. God cannot, God will not accept someone into his presence who is not righteous, who is not holy. And the great truth in this is that when an individual comes to Christ, when an individual receives Christ as their Lord and Savior, at that moment the very righteousness of Christ is imputed to them. In other words, His righteousness becomes their righteousness. Our sin became His sin. And His righteousness becomes our righteousness. Acceptance by God is always based on righteousness. And our personal righteousness before God is worthless in His sight. The Bible says that all our righteousness is as filthy rags. And that particular wording there for filthy rags refers to the menstrual rags of a woman during her cycle. And so all of our personal righteousness is as filthy rags before God in Isaiah chapter 64 and verse 6. Romans chapter 4 and verse 5 says, But to him who does not work, but believes on him who justifies the ungodly, his faith is accounted for righteousness. In Philippians chapter 3, verse 7 through 9, it says, But what things were gained to me, these I have counted lost for Christ. Yet, indeed, I also count all things lost for the excellence of the knowledge of Jesus Christ my Lord, for whom I have suffered the loss of all things, and count them as rubbish, that I may gain Christ and be found in Him, listen very carefully, not having my own righteousness which is from the law but that which is through faith in Christ the righteousness which is from God by faith so the Holy Spirit will convict the world of righteousness and what righteousness is it's very important to us as we present the gospel information to an unbeliever, that we emphasize these three aspects of what God emphasizes or what the Holy Spirit emphasizes to the unbeliever. We must emphasize sin. We must emphasize the right standard. Obviously, sin, uh, all of our righteousness is, is worthless before God. We must make clear that the standard is Jesus Christ. There has to be something proper for the individual to measure themselves against. And they know, they know innately, deep inside of them, Romans chapter 1, 
they know that they are unrighteous before God. Even though when they knew God, they did not honor Him as God or glorify Him as God. So, we want to make these things clear as we present the gospel. Next, the Holy Spirit convicts the world, it says here, of judgment. What He does is that He presses in on the heart of the unsaved. The great and solemn issue of God's judgment on those who reject His Son. John chapter 16 verse 11 says, Of judgment because the ruler of this world is judged. The ruler of this world is Satan. In Colossians chapter 2 and verse 16, Scripture states that Christ made an open triumph over demonic principalities and powers. This is what it says, having disarmed principalities and powers. He made a public spectacle of them, triumphing over them in it. For the lost person, spiritual judgment is inevitable. It's unavoidable. It's certain. It is inescapable. It is predestined. It is foreordained, preordained. For anyone who dies without Christ, there is judgment. No one, absolutely no one who refuses Christ can escape. These are the kind of issues, the kind of points in presenting the gospel that we need to make clear. How the Holy Spirit uses it. How the Holy Spirit brings about conviction through these issues. That's His work. It's not my work. My work is to make the issues clear. And the Holy Spirit will produce the conviction. The, the conviction. He will establish the weight. He will establish the pressure. He will establish the calling on an individual. No one, absolutely no one, who refuses Christ can escape. We don't get a vote. God's not ask our opinion about judgment. He's not ask our opinion about the final destiny of the lost and the unsaved. He's not curious as to what we think about the lake of fire. And what we know very clearly is that the lost man does not think that the punishment fits the crime. It just doesn't make sense to them. That they could just be, you know, live what they consider to be a good life, be a good father, be a good husband, be a good, a good worker, good mother, good wife, good student. And yet, they believe that their standard is what they will be measured against, and it's not. And God has not asked for our input. The issue is very clear. It's appointed unto men once to die, and then the judgment. And they get no input into that. It's a simple fact. Just as clearly as the sun will rise in the eastern sky tomorrow, no one will escape the judgment of the Lord Jesus Christ. And the Holy Spirit wants men to know that. He wants men to know that if they die in their sins, that they will face the judgment, the eternal judgment of God in a place of eternal torment. He wants men to be fully cognizant of God's impending judgment on every person who refuses to come to Christ. It's part of the message. It's part of the gospel work of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believer to convict them of sin, of righteousness, and eventually of judgment. And the Holy Spirit is the one who ju judicially condemns an individual to damnation upon their ultimate refusal of Christ. Remember we have been very clear that the only damning sin is the sin 
of unbelievers, un unbelief. It is a sin of horrific and enormous proportions to reject Christ. It really is quite unexplainable. The magnitude, the eternalness of judgment and what it's like, the horror of it uh, to, to be burning but never burning up, to be dying but never really dying, to be in a place of indescribable torment. And, and, and once again, the lost man thinks that there are many other options. There's purgatory, you know, where someone believes that even if they go to a place of judgment and they have to suffer for their sins, that somebody can pay their penance and pray them out of that place eventually. And so in, in the long run, everything will be okay. Obviously, that is quite unscriptural. But men think that they are good. Men think that they are good enough to merit God's salvation. And so they let these things go, and they're not, they're not cognizant. They're not willing to think about what the Scriptures say. And the Scriptures are clear. Salvation always begins with our being brought to a profound sense of our need for a Savior, for Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit is the one who does that. But He also, in very clear terms, wants to communicate the consequences and the results of someone who is not willing to come to Christ. The result is judgment. It is the judgment of God on their life. There is a place there is a lake of fire. It is a place where the Bible says in the end of Revelation that somebody will be brought up before they will be pulled out of Hades. They will be brought up before the great white throne judgment of God. And there the books will be opened. And if their names are not written in the Lamb's book of life, an angel will come and he will ex balo. He will cast them into the lake of fire. It is an eternal judgment. There is no escape. There is no back door. There is no exit out of that place. The horror, the horrific magnitude of what we are discussing is beyond anyone's ability to describe. The absolute magnitude of the suffering that will take place. And there's never any escape. Oh, my heart just breaks for people that I have known in the past. People who, for whatever reason, just would never come to Christ they rejected Christ. And unfortunately, their life was removed from them. And they have stood. They have stood before Holy God. They have been, they are in a place of torment and will be cast later into another place of eternal judgment called the lake of fire when they are brought up and cast Balo into that eternal place. There's a great need today that men be convinced of this impending judgment of God, both on the world and in eternity after death. And one of the three primary ministries of the Holy Spirit is to actually speak of God's judgment. In Hebrews chapter 10, verse 31, it's a verse that I, I am confident is speaking about the church and about how the church has not taken the sacred things of God seriously. They've insulted the Spirit of grace. They have trampled the Son of God 
underfoot. They have treated him lightly. They've treated the things of God lightly, the Word of God, the, the Church of God. They, they've treated the work of the Holy Spirit lightly in their life. And the Bible says that the Lord will judge His people, and it says next after that in Hebrews 10.31, that it is a fearful thing. It is an amazingly fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God. You know, the lost man just simply cannot appreciate what that means. They cannot appreciate the awfulness of, of what it means to fall into the hands of a righteous God, an unholy man in the hands of a righteous God. I, I, never, I, I never personally, I, I never cease to be amazed at how casually, at how indifferently, at how nonchalantly men seem to simply brush off the most serious of all eternal issues. One of the amazing, amazing things about sharing the gospel in a place like Zimbabwe, out in the bush, is that life is as simple as it can be. It's a matter, really, of survival, of being able to get water every day. Of There's no rain. I, I was there recently for two and a half weeks. I'd been there in June, and I was back again in August. And... In the two and a half weeks that I was there, I never saw one single cloud. Not one single cloud in the sky. There was no possibility of rain. They have been in a drought for so long that it just defies description. Everything, even in, in their summer, everything was just dead. There's no leaves on the trees. There's a few trees that have some green leaves, but for the most part, Everything is brown and everything is dead. But you know, it's, their, their life is very simple. And I appreciate the fact that even though no one had ever taken the gospel to them, that they culturally still had an understanding. I, I think it would be in alignment with Romans chapter 1. They still had an understanding of things that were eternal. They, they believed in the Creator God. They, they believed, uh, and I would use this word consistently in the presentation, they believed in a place called Gehenna, a place of torment. And they believed that, that people, when they died, based on certain things, that they, they would go to this place called Gehenna. And we would have a, an entire family sitting around listening to the presentation of the gospel. And I would be drawing on the dirt with a stick. And I would talk about Gehenna. And it was really precious. I would say something like this. I, I would say, I would draw the flames. And I would talk about the horror of it. And what it was like. And, and what impending judgment was. And, and I would say something like, do you want to go to Gehenna? And just, just in almost unison, they would just all say no. No, they, they have a particular word for no. And they would just say no, no. And then I would say, do you want to spend eternity with God in a place called heaven? And they would go, yebo, yebo. Yebo, which means yes. I, I, I'm just, here in America, I, I'm just never, I, I'm, I, I never cease to be amazed at how nonchalantly, how, how indifferently men seem to brush off these incredibly important eternal issues as if somehow they don't apply to them. You may not be that interested in rewards or you may not be that interested in the rapture of the church or you may not be too overly concerned with what heaven is going to be like. Those are things that 
are going to take place for the believer, we're going to stand before the judgment seat of Christ and, and we're going to give an account of our life, what we did with our life. My works are going to be judged, not for salvation, but for rewards. And every day that I lose, every week that I lose, every year, that month or year that I, I lose in my life and without a, 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 a fundamental uh, conviction about the things of God and what it means to be committed in living for Christ. I'm losing something at an eternal level. You know, if you put your money into a bank or some investment, what happens is that over a period of time it compounds. It grows. It, it, it can double. And in the same way, when we when we gain rewards, I, I believe that in eternity that they, they have a compounding effect in our life. So we're losing much more than just, than just a reward. We are losing the compounding effect of those rewards in eternity. They're, the everlasting nature of them being lost. You may not care that much about the rapture of the church and when that's going to take place, which none of us know. It's an important event in the life of the church. You may not be concerned with what heaven is like. You know, people talk about pie in the sky and the sweet by and by. And that certainly is not my picture of heaven or the kingdom of God and what it's going to be like in the eternal state. For an unbeliever, to just dismiss judgment. To simply set aside the issue of spending eternity in an indescribable place of torment. And to think that it will not happen to them because there is something so very special about them and about their life. It is the gravest of all mistakes. You're talking about a misjudgment. If we ever talk about someone not judging or not assessing something properly, for someone to get to this place, for them to set aside the issue of impending judgment on their life, to think that it will not happen to them because they, there's something about them that is different. There's something about them that God will overlook. There's something about them that God will excuse. There's something about their life that will allow them into the kingdom of God. Something that they did. I can tell you the truth. There's not a single one of us that ever want, as far as salvation is concerned, for us to be judged according to our works. What we know is that the judgment of God on the unsaved is certain. It's inevitable. It's, it's pending. Not long ago, we had, where I live, in South Carolina, we had uh, a friend of my granddaughter's. And... Uh, not what I would consider to be a good friend, just a, an acquaintance of theirs, somebody that she was in high school with, somebody that she knew. And one night, this young man was with another young man, and they were out on the highway. They were just uh, obviously going much, much too fast. And <clears throat> They were probably going about 100 miles an hour on a curvy road. They ran off the road, lost control, ran into a telephone pole, and the driver of the car was killed immediately. The passenger in the other seat was thrown out of the car. The car rolled over him. He survived, but he is paralyzed. He's paralyzed from the neck down for the rest of his life. A little 17 year old boy. 
And I, I, I just was heartbroken when we found out the next day. I, I obviously did not know either one of these young men, but I was just heartbroken. What do I know? Why am I heartbroken? I'm heartbroken because I know that the judgment of God on that individual is certain. The judgment is something that will take place and it will be swift. It will be irrevocable. It will be irreversible. You know, we live in a, in a judicial system where we have what we call the appellate process. The appellate process is the appeals process. Someone is convicted of a crime and and uh, they go to prison, but they can still avail themselves of the appellate process. And the appeal itself could take up to seven or eight years for it to go through the judicial system. In other words, the individual believes that they still have another chance and that they can, they can be released from uh, the guilty sentence that they were given. There is no appellate process in the kingdom of God. There's one judge. There's no jury. There's one judge. He makes the determination. He declares a sentence. And that is it. It's irrevocable. It's irreversible. There will never be another chance provided Never another opportunity to respond to the gospel. There never ever be someone that will approach them with the gospel message of salvation. There will never be another time in their life when the grace of God, when the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit is active and at work in their life. It will simply be an instant and a final judgment. No unsaved person escapes. No matter who they are, no matter where they live, no matter what their circumstances are, not one individual somehow avoids or eludes the judgment of God. Not one. John chapter 5 verse 24 is clear on who is spared from the judgment. Listen very carefully as I read this. John chapter 5, verse 24. It says, Most assuredly, without any reservation, I say to you, he who hears my word and believes in him who sent me has everlasting life and shall not come into judgment, but has passed from death into life. You know, I've heard people speak at times about the gospel and taking the gospel message to different parts of the world, uh, fulfilling the Great Commission if, if you would. And the question always comes up in, in one way or another as to whether or not what would happen to somebody that lives, somebody that lives out in the middle of nowhere, sort of where uh, I go and uh, preach in Zimbabwe, I mean, these people literally live in the middle of nowhere. They live out in the bush. Nobody has ever come to them and, and, and brought the gospel to them. What would happen to them? You know, they have no, they have no, they have no Bible. They have no church. They, there's no pastor. What happens to them and their children as after they, they grow up and they live their life and they die? The average lifespan in Zimbabwe is 51. I'm sure a lot of that comes from those who have 
died as young children. The AIDS epidemic has sort of dropped that that age down, I'm sure. What happens to them? Are, are they innocent? They've never heard the gospel. They, they, I, somebody would say, do you believe that God would send some innocent person to hell? Uh, someone who has never heard the gospel? you believe that God would do that? And my answer to them is always the same. It's, there is nobody like that. There is no innocent person. Romans chapter 1 is, is very clear that God, since the creation of the world, His invisible attributes are clearly seen, being understood by the things that are made, even His eternal power and Godhead, so that they are without excuse. They exchanged, it says, the truth of God for the lie and worshipped and served the creature rather than the Creator who is blessed forever. Even the people that I talked to that never heard the Gospel, they somehow still believe in a Creator God and in a place of judgment. Why? Because God has planted eternity in your hearts. You know, if people could get saved because they never heard the gospel, it seems to me that the worst thing that we could ever do would be to take the gospel to them. If somebody could be saved and God in His mercy not judge them because they just lived in a place and they never heard the gospel, why should we take the gospel to them? To me, it would be the worst thing, the most tragic thing that I could ever do. Here in Romans chapter 10, God speaking about Israel and how they had rejected the gospel. And it says, How then shall they call on Him in whom they have not believed? And how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? And how shall they preach unless they are sent? says a little bit later in verse 17, So then faith comes by hearing, and hearing by the Word of God. You know, we really ought to look at that passage backwards. We ought to look at it backwards. We, we ought to take it this way. They, they, somebody has to be sent. Somebody has to go. I took, uh, this past time, I took a couple of my men from my church. One of the men had been a, a missionary. He and his wife had been missionaries in the Central African Republic for a good number of years. So he was very familiar with Africa and, and what it was like. But the other man had never, had never done that. He had never ever really shared the gospel in, a, in, in this kind of way. And so he was very nervous. He was a little anxious about about what was going to take place, but I kept emphasizing to them before we ever left, somebody has to go. Somebody has to take the message of salvation. Somebody has to be sent. How shall they preach unless they are sent? And how shall they hear without a preacher? How can they hear the message without somebody communicating the message to them, and how shall they believe in Him? I'm reading this backwards. In whom, in Him, how shall they believe in Him of whom they have not heard? They have to hear about Him. And how can they call on Him in whom they've not believed? They can't call on Him and believe in Him until they know who He is. And that's why he says here, Paul says, so then faith comes by hearing. Hearing what? And hearing by the Word of God. Somebody has to take the message. Why? Why does somebody, why do you, why do I, why does God make us responsible for all of these things? For Matthew chapter 28, to go into the world and to make disciples. Listen, you cannot make disciples 
until you have someone who has been saved. There has to be evangelism. There has to be outreach. There has to be the communication of the gospel. It's not optional for either the individual Christian or for the church. Yet we've made it optional. Well, God hasn't called me. There's nothing in Matthew chapter 28 that provides an option for anyone. It's a command to all of us to go, to preach, to communicate the gospel. I love what happened to this, this man while he was there. One day we were, I think the first couple days were a little slow for him. He was struggling a little bit with the presentation of the gospel and finally it just the Holy Spirit began to work through him and one day it was late in the afternoon and everybody had was sort of coming in to our central point where where we were would walk to and he came in and he was just grinning for ear to ear and he said Satan has lost many souls this day and as we went back it was almost a two hour drive to where we got back to where we were staying after we ate he went back to his room and he began to adjust the gospel presentation for what he was learning and how to present it and the next day the next morning we got up early we ate breakfast we were ready to leave about eight o'clock it was still another two hour drive back to where we were going uh, on dirt roads out in just the middle of nowhere uh, not really roads that are designed for cars and uh, all the way all he could talk about was the gospel and the power of the gospel and he says I'm not leaving the place today until they give me a yes or a no I loved it as his pastor, I just loved his attitude. I, I'm taking the gospel and I'm not leaving that compound until they tell me, yes, I will accept Christ or no, I will not accept Christ. He understood. He understood what was at stake for these people in, in their lives. Romans chapter 1, verse 28 through 32 gives us some insight into the lost and into their assessment of God's judgment on their life. Listen to these verses. And even as they did not like to retain God in their knowledge, God gave them over to a debased mind to do those things which are not fitting being filled with all unrighteousness, sexual immorality, wickedness, covetousness, maliciousness, full of envy, murder, strife, deceit, evil-mindedness. They are whisperers, backbiters, haters of God, violent, proud, boasters, inventors of evil things, disobedient to parents, undiscerning, untrustworthy, unloving, unforgiving, unmerciful. Listen very carefully who knowing the righteous judgment of God, who knowing the righteous judgment of God, that those who practice such things are deserving of death, not only do the same, but also approve of those who practice them. You know what that verse, those verses tell me? It tells me that men do not fear God and they do not fear the judgment of God. That is a misassessment on their part. A very serious misassessment. Hebrews chapter 9 verse 27 is very clear regarding the judgment when it says, and it is as, as, is, and as it is appointed for men to die once, but after this, the judgment, the judgment of God. Jude chapter 1 verse 14 through 15 says, Now Enoch the seventh from Adam prophesied about these men also, saying, Behold, the Lord comes with ten thousand of his saints 
to execute judgment on all. The Lord is coming with ten thousands, plural, of His saints to execute judgment on all, to convict all who are ungodly among them of all of their ungodly deeds which they have committed in an ungodly way and all of the harsh things which ungodly sinners have spoken against Him, have spoken against Christ. So the Holy Spirit, as a part of the message of God, is always convicting the world with respect to their sin and the impending judgment which will follow. It is inevitable. Now I think it's important for us to appreciate that judgment has, this judgment that we're talking about has been committed to Jesus Christ. Acts chapter 17 verse 31 says, Because he has appointed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. He has given assurance of this to all, by raising him from the dead. He's appointed a day in which he's going to judge the world in righteousness by the man whom he has ordained. That is the God-man, the Lord Jesus Christ. He's given us assurance of these things. He raised him from the dead. John chapter 5 verse 22 says, for the Father judges no one, but has committed all judgment to the Son. Romans chapter 2 and verse 16 says, In the day when God will judge the secrets of men by Jesus Christ according to my gospel. Listen to these words in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, verse 7 through 10. And to give you who are troubled rest with us when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire, taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His power when He comes in that day to be glorified in His saints and to be admired among all those who believe because our testimony among you was believed. So it says here that the Lord Jesus will be revealed from heaven with his mighty angels in flaming fire taking vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. These shall be punished with everlasting destruction from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of his power. Revelation chapter 20, verse 11 through 15 should be some of the most frightening words in all of Scripture for those people who are lost and without Christ. It says, Then I saw a great white throne, and him who sat on it, from whose face the earth and the heaven fled away. And there was found no place for them. No place. And I saw the dead, small and great, standing before God, and books were opened. And another book was opened, which is the book of life. And the dead were judged according to their works. Not a good thing. By the things which were written in the books. The sea gave up the dead who were in it, and death and Hades delivered up the dead who were in them. And they were judged, each one according to his works. Not a good thing. 
Then death and Hades were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death, and anyone not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. Not a good thing. You know, for those of us who are pastors, preachers, for those of us who, anyone who evangelizes and communicates the gospel, there are just certain things that I think the scriptures, if I can use this word, it's a strong word, demand that we get right. I'm not saying that God can use our, cannot use us if we get something that's not quite right. Obviously, there have been plenty of people who have led other people to Christ who were fairly immature in their faith, really didn't have a good explanation of the gospel. They just knew that Jesus had saved them and they had come to Him. And they took that love for God and that love for Christ and they communicated it to people that they loved and they came to Christ. But I think for those of us that are in the ministry, you know, Paul, if you go through the pastoral epistles, there are places there where he tells Timothy, he says, Timothy, follow me. Follow my example. Do as I do. He wasn't afraid to say, hey, listen, you can emulate me. You can emulate my life and you'll be okay. There are certain parts of the message of God it's that you and I have to get correct, but it's not just a matter of our getting something correct. It's not just a matter of us, well, turning to this passage here in John chapter 16 and reading it to somebody about the, the judgment of God and, and sin and righteousness and, and clicking off the information If I can use this word, if I, if I can describe what I'm trying to communicate to you this way, there has to be some passion about it. There has to be some deep conviction. Paul there in, where is it, in 2 Corinthians chapter 5, I believe it's chapter 5, verse 21, he says, now then, we are ambassadors for Christ as though, as though God were pleading through us. He was pleading through us. We implore you. It means we beg you. We urge you. We admonish you. And we do it with passion and with an intensity in our spirit and in our minds and in our hearts and in our words. We implore you on Christ's behalf to be reconciled to God. You know, sometimes there's just, unfortunately, there's just much missing in a gospel presentation. We tack it on at the end of the service. I go to Romania on three different occasions each year. And uh, normally on, we leave on Thursday, get there on Friday, on Saturday night, I will be preaching in different places in a, a, uh, one of the village uh, buildings normally. But, you know, most villages only have two or three hundred people in them. But I can share this with you as honestly and as transparently and as simply as I know how that every time that I get that opportunity and I stand up to preach the gospel, I do it with great, great passion. It's intense. Why? Because I, I believe the message of the gospel is intense. I, I don't want people to die in their sins. I don't want people to die without Christ. We can be assured that no unsaved person will ever escape the judgment of God on their unbelief. And the scripture is clear that on the day of judgment, 
that no one will be able to say, I did not know or I did not understand. Be assured that the Bible declares that every mouth will be closed, that every tongue will be stopped, and that the whole world will be held accountable before a holy God because of their sin. Be assured that one day that God is going to hold every unsaved person accountable for their sin and for their sins against Jesus Christ. Let me close by simply putting it this way. As we think about the work and the ministry of the Holy Spirit as it applies to His conviction in the world. Time is short. Time is short. Time is just fleeting by. God's wrath is absolutely certain. And eternity hangs in the balance. I pray that God would help us. God would help us to understand what the ministry, the convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit is all about and to be in alignment with His passion, with His concern, with His words, with the truth, with the message, so that men and women and boys and girls and young people who do not know Christ will be presented the gospel in a meaningful way. I, I can't do it. You can't do it without this convicting ministry of the Holy Spirit in the life of the unbeliever. 